when we'll we'll find out, I hope, whether life is unique, whether the whether but and the, the Einstein asked a question in the case of physics, which I suppose you could ask in the case of biology. He phrased it poorly because did he God said, have a choice? Yeah, yeah. yeah he said, did yeah. God have a choice in the yeah. creation of the universe? Yeah. And he, by that he didn't mean God. He meant, is there just one set of laws of physics? Uh, and if you twiddle one knob, will the whole thing fall apart? And, 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 but I think it's an interesting question also in the case of biology, and we'll find out. Is there one, is, did God have a choice in the creation of life in, in, in yeah. that sense? Is there one, in, is there well, one? Well, we've, we've talked about that, and you've come down heavily on, on, on one extreme, which is, that, which is that there is no, no, no choice, and I came down uh, on a slightly less extreme. But going to the physics qu um, question and the idea that the, the physical constants, whatever it is, half a dozen or so numbers, which physicists can't explain at the moment, but just simply accept as physical constants. Um, if you twiddle those knobs uh, and you get a different, would you get a different kind of universe? Would you get no universe at all? Is there only one way for a universe to be? Um, I mean, what's your view? Well, I th that is, in fact, I think the central question of physics. And sometimes the thing that drives me, and I suspect many of my colleagues who do particle physics or cosmology, the question is, can, I mean, I grew up, I, I became a scientist because I wanted to understand wh why the universe is the way it is, not why it should often be different. And, and therefore, the suspicion and the way science has worked uh, for 400 years is that, since, since Newton at least, and Galileo probably before that, is that in fact, there are, that if, in order to understand what we see, there are unique sets of physical laws and we would hope that we might ultimately understand the set of physical, physical laws that explained everything and that there would be a theory of everything. Uh, that was a hope, and it's still a hope in some sense. But in fact, um, it, it, it is looking more and more to many people, to many physicists, like that hope may be mis misplaced, that in fact um, the laws of physics may be an environmental accident and physics would become, God forbid, an environmental science. Because... Um, <laughs> Bec and the reason, the reason is, is this one discovery, which is really the reason I wrote the new book in some sense, the most inexplicable discovery in, in the last century, the fact that empty space, empty space has energy. That if you take a region of space, get rid of all the particles and all the radiation, everything, that space weighs something. There's nothing there, but it has energy. And it's changed everything about the future of the universe and the present, and maybe we'll talk about it. But it is something that is so inexplicable that physicists have latched on a, a possible solution, which is very unpalatable to many of us, but may be true. Why, is, why does empty space have the energy it does? We don't have any idea. In fact, it flies in the face of all fundamental calculations we can perform. If we perform fundamental calculations, we predict a number that's 120 orders of magnitude wrong. It's the worst prediction in all of physics, so we never used to talk about it. And, but, <laughs> But in fact, there may be another explanation, and that is if the energy of empty space were much bigger, see, if you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive. It blows, it doesn't suck, okay? And that means that, that it, it's causing the current expansion of the universe to speed up, which is unprecedented, it's un, was almost unbelievable. And, but that means, well, and we'll talk about what it means for the future, but if the energy were much greater, then the universe would have started speeding up much earlier. And in fact, it would have started speeding up before galaxies formed. And that gravitational repulsion would have caused matter to move apart before it could collapse into galaxies. And that means there'd be no galaxies. But if there are no galaxies, there'd be no stars. And if there are no stars, there'd be no planets. If there are no planets, there'd be no astronomers. And so the universe is the way it is because astronomers are here to measure it, is the argument. And it, so it, sounds, it sounds funny, but it's actually maybe true. It's something called the anthropic principle, but if it's true, it means this fundamental constant in nature is an accident. And there may be many universes in which that number is different. But in those universes, there aren't people around or beings around, perhaps, to ask the question. So it, it addresses the, in one of the fundamental aspects of the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is, you know, if there were nothing, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. I've always been very attracted by the anthropic principle. I think, I think it's elegant and neat. I, I know physicists hate it. Um, but, uh, but I think you, you probably, in order to make it ex explanatory, give it explanatory power, you do need to postulate 
lots of universes, don't you? You need to postulate lots of universes, but you need to postulate more than just that. First of all, the anthropic principle, one of the things, it's often been proposed in physics, always when there's something inexplicable. And historically, at least, throughout the last century, there have been a number of times in the evolution of stars it looked like the parameters of physics had to be fine-tuned so you could make carbon and get you know, beyond helium. And it looked like, well, you know, that has to be fine-tuned and maybe, maybe it's anthropic. Maybe it's just a number that if it were any different, we wouldn't be here. But every time that's happened, we've actually come up with a fundamental theory that explained it. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen this time. But, but, it, but the anthropic principle, in order to be predictive, has to be, it, you have to assume many universes. But you have to assume that you know the probability distribution for the parameters. Otherwise, you don't know, you can't predict the likelihood that we'll be here. And you have to know which parameters are fixed by fundamental laws and which ones can vary, and we don't know that. And the other thing that it really assumes, which is really not at all clear, and it comes back to biology, is that we are typical. Because if we're not typical, it could be, we don't know the varieties of life that can exist. And it could be if the laws of nature were very different you wouldn't form stars, you wouldn't form planets, but we don't know that you wouldn't form life. So you have to assume for the anthropic principle to be operational that we are typical of life forms in the universe. And that is an incredible assumption that I think is not at this point warranted. So that's my big problem with the anthropic principle is that we don't know in any sense that we're typical. And in fact, I've argued to some of my colleagues that if you use that typicality argument, we'd be having this discussion underwater because most of the earth is covered in water. And if you ask where should life, intelligent life naturally arise, it should be in water, because that's more probable. Yeah. And so we're certainly not, in, at least the kind of life that, that can carry on this conversation doesn't exist in water. Whether there's intelligence in dolphins or others is something to be discovered. And so it's, there are a lot of hidden assumptions and, it, and the problem is it's hard to test them unless you have many different examples of life or in some cases, unless you have many universes. And when it comes to cosmology, unlike potentially, well, with biology, we're suffering from the fact that we only know of life on Earth. And therefore, we make lots of speculations about the kind of life that might exist. In, in physics, in cosmology, we have a much bigger problem. We live in one universe. Well, most of us do, again, except the Republican candidate. <laughs> but, but, um, but, and that means we may forever have limits on our knowledge. And, and one of the things I, I try to talk about in my book, and, and one of the things that fascinates me, is we have made such progress that we may be pushing up against those limits right now. There may be fundamental scientific questions that we now know the answer to that we never can get an empirical answer to because we're stuck either living 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, and maybe we, if we lived earlier or later, we would have access to information we don't have because we could talk about the fact that in the future there'll be much less information or the fact that we, 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 we just live in one universe and we can't access the locus of all possible universes. And one of the things that fascinated me about, about your book is, is this idea that we, we, we live, as you put it, in a very propitious time. Uh, because if we, if we lived, a, a, I don't know, a, a trillion years later, the universe would have, it would have deleted all traces of, the, um, of its origins, of its... Of its um, uh, progenitors that we can detect because we happen to be living at this time when there are when light can still reach us from other galaxies whereas if we lived uh, in a trillion years time the galaxies would have receded beyond the horizon where, where we could detect them and we would have absolutely no evidence of any kind um, that there was more than one galaxy for in example. Fact, we, I find it very poetic in fact what, what you'd find in, in a trillion years in the future is that we would go back to the picture we had merely a hundred years ago. And that's one of the other reasons to write a book like this at this time, is that it is amazing. We're like the early map makers. It is amazing in a single human lifetime how much things have changed. It's hard to appreciate it. 85 years ago, we, the, the, well, yeah, 85 years ago, a single human lifetime easily, we knew of one galaxy in the universe. That was it. The conventional scientific wisdom was that our Milky Way was the entire universe. We now know there are 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe. 85 years ago, the universe was static and eternal as far as scientists were concerned. So, so the, their picture of the universe was that we lived in a single galaxy surrounded by an eternity of empty space that had always been that way and always would be that way. And everything changed. Of course, we discovered the universe had a beginning which had profound significance for science and for theology, as we may talk about. 
And it, if you go in the far future, what is kind of remarkable to me is that beings who live on what will be the Milky Way galaxy, because we're going to collide with our neighbors and we'll, we'll form some big, not, not a nice spiral galaxy, but probably something called an elliptical galaxy. But there'll be stars around in two trillion years, stars like our sun, that therefore have solar power and there'll be organic molecules and there'll be planets around them and therefore you could imagine life forming around those stars. But astronomers who will discover the laws of physics, they'll discover general relativity, they'll discover electromagnetism, they'll discover quantum mechanics, and they'll do the best experiments they can do. They'll build telescopes and they'll come up with a picture which is completely wrong. They'll come up with a picture which is identical to the picture we had. Just one on, galaxy and, that, and that's, and, that's and it. it yeah. So we are lucky and, yes. and in fact I like to say we, we live at a uh, 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 we're fortunate to live in a very special time. The only time when we can know we live, we're living in a very special time. And, <laughs> but, 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 but by that I mean I'm, I'm facetious because you know we have this picture which, which is weird. But it may not be complete. It could be that those beings living 100 billion or trillion years from now will have access to observational information of some sort that we don't have we, today. We don't know about that. And so we should have some kind of cosmic humility 